everyone joining us here at Africa House in London and those of you who are joining us online as well. My name is Lydia Kellett and I'm a managing associate in the corporate team at Mishkondorea and also uh, a member of the sports group too. I'm really delighted to be hosting this panel session with these guys today talking about the really interesting area of athlete investment and sport. Now, before we get underway, some of you may well not have attended a Sports Law Academy session before. And if you haven't, welcome. Hope you enjoy your first session. And for those who don't know a bit about it, here's a bit of introduction. Now, the SLA is a free to access academic distance learning program designed for junior lawyers, students and non-legal professionals for those already working in the industry, as well as those looking to gain a unique different practical insight into contemporary sports law issues. And our goal is to facilitate debate, examine key issues in the world of sport and share knowledge as well in order to improve industry standards, promote diversity and nurture talent as well. Please do get involved with the SLA as much as possible, whether that's during this event or afterwards too. Please drop us an email, please post on our SLA LinkedIn page, or please just put up your hand and raise a question. It's always great to hear from you. And we love your feedback. And we especially love your feedback because it helps us really create the program for next year as well. So moving on to today's event about athlete investment in sport, really excited to explore this interesting area with this amazing panel of speakers. We have Marvin Sordell, Joe Tarn and Adam Osper. So enough from me. Marvin, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, I can do. <laughs> uh, my name is Marvin. I'm a former professional football player. I played for 10 years across many different clubs. I'm not going to name them because we won't have time for anything else. Um, I played for England at under 20 and under 21 level and Team GB at London 2012 as well. Now I'm many things. I'm a filmmaker and an entrepreneur. Amazing. So. Thank you, Marvin. Joe. So I'm Joe. Um, I run a sports agency, mainly based in football and a production company. My background was I started as a football reporter. So I started on the other side in broadcast and then moved across to become an agent. Um, I work a lot in women's sports. So that's sort of um, a growing area, as I'm sure you all know. And on the production side, we generally make football documentaries or programmes. Although I was just telling Marvin, we did recently diversify and do a Quincy Jones doc for a radio, for BBC Radio, which nearly killed me. But um, was you know, my passion is, is music, but football's the mainstay of the business. Amazing. And Adam? I'm Adam Osper. I'm a managing partner at Evelyn Partners. I am a financial planner. Um, I run our sports and entertainment division, um, which I've been running for nine years, been working in the industry for 22, been working in the sports and entertainment space for 15. And um, I have a client bank of around 50 sports and entertainment clients, predominantly football, some music, boxing, cycling, cricket. Um, and I basically help them look after their money so that when they finish football, um, they're not broke, ideally. Amazing. Thanks, Adam. Um, if you'd like to just pop onto the slides, just one moment. Great. So here we all are. So athletes doing deals with businesses and brands is nothing new, but the modern athlete is becoming increasingly savvy to the range of commercial opportunities that may be available to them, not only during their sporting career, but in retirement as well. And at the same time, we're seeing brands embracing new ways to collaborate with sports stars. Now enter the athlete investor and athlete investment. Now in a traditional endorsement deal, a brand will pay a sports star a fee for a range of intellectual property rights, including their likeness and their voice, as well as a couple of other services, for example, the opportunity to shoot content, an agreed number of uh, performances, a plus social media posts as well. But gone are the days when this sort of traditional endorsement deal is the only way to structure a brand and talent. We're now seeing it, seeing increasing number of different sorts of structures, different sorts of ways for a brand and a talent to collaborate. And on the rise are sorts of investments that include cash and equity in companies. Now, why are athletes looking at a different sort of endorsement deal? Well, when structured correctly, they can be a real big win-win for all parties. So from the athlete's perspective, a career can be short sometimes and injuries can shorten it even further. And capitalising on revenue and cash 
income can reap major benefits, not only, as I say, during the course of their career, but during their retirement as well. And likewise for founders and brands, they're becoming more aware of athlete investors, amazing social media presence, also contact book, and also their ability to provide strategic advisory inputs later on. Now, athlete investment is much more developed over in the US than it is over here, but it's becoming increasingly popular over here in the UK and Europe. Now, some examples of investments by US athletes include LeBron James's investments in Beats and in Fenway Sports Group, which owns Liverpool and the Red Sox. We have Serena Williams's investment in Coinbase in addition to her own VC firm, Serena Ventures. We have Michael Jordan's stake in Charlotte Hornets. Now it goes that apparently he earned about 50, sorry, $90 million earning um, it's an income from playing basketball, whereas his global wealth today is estimated to be about $1.8 billion. In other words, he earned only 5% of his global income from actually playing basketball on court. And actually major part of his global wealth is from his other investments. Now, as I say, it's becoming increasingly popular over here in the UK. And some examples of UK athletes investments include AJ's collaboration with DAZN and his investment in DAZN as well. And Andy Murray's investment in Castor and collaboration with Castor as well. And in fact, the sports team here at Mishcon advised on that collaboration. So delving on to the topic of athlete incomes and investment structures. Now, an athlete's income streams can be divided into two main pots. We have the on-pitch income, which is broadly salary and playing bonuses. We then have the off-pitch income, which is broadly divided into a couple of groups. We have sponsorships and endorsements. So, team deals, so the boys and city PX. We have individual deals, brand ambassadors, and and media opportunities. We also have investments, and these can usually be divided into traditional investments, such as investments in real estate or art or cars and alternative investments. Now, it's these alternative investments that we're looking at today. But what do we mean by alternative investments? Now, these are investments in companies and they go beyond a commercial agreement, a traditional endorsement agreement and into an equity stake. That means the athlete becomes a shareholder in a company. Now, what do they actually look like in practice? How does an athlete become an investor, a shareholder in a company. Well, now, there are a couple of ways to do this. The first and most obvious example is the athlete invests cash and they get shares in return. Now, in terms of how much cash they invest and how many shares they get in return, that really depends on how much the company is worth. And the athlete's team may be able to negotiate a discount, for example, on the share price, depending on their profile, for example. So an example of all of this could be Say if the, the stake was 500K, now the athlete might invest 500K of cash in exchange for 500K of shares. On the other hand, say if they had uh, an IP rights agreement worth 100K a year, they may well enter into that, put 400K of cash in and get 500K of shares in return. So they've made up their 500K worth of shares by way of 400K in cash and 100K in shares. An alternative might be that they do put 500K of cash in, for example, and there'd be a separate brand ambassador agreement, for example, another sort of commercial agreement. And the beauty of that sort of structure is that by way of the shareholding, the athlete will reap dividends, all being well, on the shares, in addition to income under their brand ambassador agreement. A different sort of structure may well be and instead of putting cash into a company, the athlete might endorse the brand instead. So in exchange for the endorsement, they may get shares in return. And again, how much goes in and how much comes out is a question of valuation. Now, this may well be the particular case if, for example, the brand or the company doesn't have a, a big marketing budget. So they may well say, athlete, we can't pay you for the endorsement, but we will give you shares 
in return. So the athlete may get shares or discounted shares in exchange for the endorsement. Now, this does blur the line between investment and sponsorship. So you'll see all these structures have a bit of, a, they are a bit of a mix between investment, traditional endorsements, cash, equity, and all things. They take many different shapes. But a third example that I want to talk about today is an, a brand ambassador role. Now, as we've said, a brand ambassador role is usually an agreement between an athlete and a brand. And the services the athlete will be, provide will include the IP, their name, their voice, their likeness across marketing channels, across social media platforms. And it may well include a royalty stake as well. And it may well include a cash subscription as well. A fourth type of agreement, in addition to the brand ambassador agreement, may be a strategic advisory position. And that's what we've seen with AJ and DAZN. So services go into the company in exchange for cash, and there may well be a side agreement alongside it where you have income and royalties and commission as well. So as I say, these deals take many different shapes, they take many different forms, and it really depends on bargaining power, on the parties, all the dynamics at play in transactions of this kind. And there are many different legal considerations that play into the sort of transaction that the advisor team and the athletes and the brand can negotiate. So, enough from me. I wanna ask these guys about their experience in the industry so far. So if I can start with you, Joe, maybe. What's what sort of investment deals have you been in with your athletes and the, the clients that you represent? I think it's really interesting because I rep both male and female athletes. It's so different on both sides. Like you have to imagine male footballers, if we, you know, let's talk about the male athletes, but they're generally footballers in my case. They have a completely different source, you know, income level than the females have traditionally had. So females that I represent, you know, I've, I've got the England captain, I've got Emma Hayes, who's the Chelsea manager, you know, they're people who are top of four lionesses. You know, these people are at the top of their game, but no one was earning money till, we weren't professional till 2014. So there was no level of income really till 2014. Everyone was semi-pro, everyone had other jobs. It's only in the last six years, eight years that we've started sort of to see income on that side. So on the male side, I'd say, yeah, straight investments. You know, everyone was in property, mm. businesses, straight deals. But on the women's side, it's really interesting at the moment because the deals that we're doing, particularly at the moment, are the share options that yeah. you spoke about. Or what I particularly like to do is the strategic advisor ones because women's sport is, it's changed so much so quickly that loads of brands, companies are going, women's sport, quick, need to get on it. But they don't quite know how they need to get on it. Whereas the athletes that we work with, they've been in it for so long. They know what women's sport needs. I just, I'm not saying the brands aren't credible because they're experts in their own field, but I think there's so much they can learn from the actual athletes who have the lived experience who, let's face it, were not in football for the money. We're in football for the love and they just want to grow the game. So we've sort of more recently, especially the last two years, it's really kicked on. A lot of the deals we're doing, we literally put them in as, Yes, we'll do some ambassador stuff and we'll do some appearance stuff. But more important to us is that this partnership is authentic mm -hmm. and it's only going to be authentic if we think you're doing the right thing for women's yeah. sport. Um, you know, if my client is going to attach their name to your brand, you've got to be doing women's sport how we want women's sport to be done properly. Yeah. And part of that is by insisting that we have a strategic advisory role yeah. or so rather than, you know, to break it down, you do a deal and it's, four appearances across the year I'd say rather than four appearances can we have two strategic days with your company where you're still getting the appearance from my yeah. client but it's just internal yeah. and they're advising you rather than just being the face and speaking you know yeah. something that you've dictated to us that we probably don't agree with if yeah. I mean you'll know from experience the amount of times you turn up to something that you as an agent and athlete that you've had no control over but you agree a deal with a, a brand You'll get a brief, you turn up on the day and they go, right, the script, you're doing this, this and this. Ultimately, you've signed the contract. You're, you're not in control. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're trying to sort of preempt that six months prior to brand appearance or ad yeah. or commercial or whatever we're doing. We've advised you on what would be best. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my experience. That's and it is really 
quite different between yeah. the male and female athletes that we work with. And did you see that the kinds of brands that are interested in your female clients sort of rocket after Nuts. the Euros? Really? It's crazy. It's so, but it's really nice because there's some brands that were involved. So I've got a client who there's a bank who were started by a female. She's a female entrepreneur. Uh, my client has a separate business. She has yeah. a, a, a business alongside being a footballer. And she'd always banked with this bank, I think because it had been started by a female and she just liked it. Yeah. Anyway, they we had a deal with them prior to the Euros, obviously go and win the Euros. And obviously all the financial companies then come in. But she's really insistent that she sticks with That's said company because they backed her and women's football prior to yeah. the glory. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many randoms that, and people, like brands don't think. So we've, mm. I'll get emails from, I don't want to name names, but mm. companies that, I mean, you wouldn't put an England athlete next to said brand for love nor money, especially money. And I think they, they go, but it's a really good deal. It's a really, they've got really, they've got a lot, you know, they've got a lot of budget they can put behind this. And I'm like, I don't care about the budget. My client cannot be seen pictured next to said mm. brand in a supermarket. Mm. Like, and they, they go, can we have some feedback? And I really don't want to be the person that writes in an email. My client cannot sit next to this brand in a suit. Like it would, yeah. but they don't think like, why are you? And I really don't want to name names, but you've got to think as a brand. Why do you want an England female footballer to endorse your brand? I understand it on surface level, mm. but think about it. Mm. Is she the right person to market for your, your purchasing power? Like, mm. are we, are you linking this up or are you just going women's sports in? Females yeah, have the yeah. pie, you know, have the spending power in the house. Let's just do that. It doesn't work. And yeah, you could look, you could do it for the money and you could, everybody could have got very cash rich yeah. in the last year. But what about the longevity? What happens yeah. in five years? And also it then limits how many brands do you want to work with? Mm. You've got to be authentic about yeah. it. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's changed exponentially in the last year. But I think, I think that really highlights the importance of having a good team around you, a good team of advisors that are not only interested in making a cut out of what you're going to get, but genuinely understand what you're looking for as an athlete. Marvin, do you have any sort of insights into this in terms of the team around you? And Yeah, I mean, it's, there are not many people like Joe. I'll be honest, in the industry. So, you know, Joe's a credit to all of her athletes and, and clients because... Mm -hmm. From what I know and from my experience, there are many different people who are in it for different reasons. Mm. And you know, I think I was fortunate very much so that I had my mum by my yeah. side, always advising me and always supporting the decisions I made. Yeah. Also, to be honest, I, I'm very stubborn mm. <laughs> and I look into a lot of things myself. I, yeah. I read things, I understand things and, and try to learn about as much as possible because in the end of the day, it's my life. And so I wanted to be, you know, from a very young age, I've always wanted, in, wanted to be in control of that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, having a team is very important, yeah. but also being able to manage and understand what you're doing yourself yeah. is, is equally as important. Yeah, definitely. What about you, Adam? When, you're, when, a, when an athlete or a client comes to you and, and says, I'm looking for this, what sort of things are you looking at? How do you, how do you approach the opportunities with them? Um, so, so it's interesting just listening to, to, to everyone talk. So what I do is probably slightly different. Mm. So the, the branding stuff we don't get involved in. And I suppose on a day-to-day -day basis, my role is to sit with the athlete um, and, and, and try to make sure that we build a structured plan so that when they finish playing whatever sport they may be in, they're financially secure. Yeah. Um, and that will depend on what level of that they're playing at. If you're a top-end Premier League footballer or if you're playing in, in the championship, yeah. those things mean slightly different things. I think when you're playing slightly higher up, in, in, in football especially, you have more opportunities. And those types of things come around for me where you have a footballer who's maybe beginning to think about what he wants to do post-career. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things that I find, and it's, it's a little bit like what Joe's saying where brands just come to fling stuff at you, is people come and fling investment opportunities to you mm -hmm. because you work with footballers and because it sounds fancy and actually because there's a misconception that because footballers, sorry, Marvin, um, you know, wear strange clothes and drive flash cars and watches and so on, that they like taking risk with their money, but actually it's the complete opposite. They actually don't like taking much risk at all with their money. So when people come to you with investment opportunities, it's being able to actually try to work out 
what's rubbish mm. and actually what is a good opportunity and actually what is the reason for the opportunity yeah. so is it because i want to make some money is is it tax related or tax led related where you're going to get some relief from the way in or actually what i try to do is actually say well what are you what do you want to do post career what's interesting to you mm. so i'm working with a couple of clients now where one of them is in just thinking about what's going to happen after football and he's interested in some sort of tech related investment so we've been meeting different tech related mm -hmm. firms and part of that is an education process for him to start learning about businesses the types of things that you're talking about how you mm -hmm. structure things and mm -hmm. a, a lot of my time around non-conventional investment is batting stuff away yeah. um, and analyzing mm -hmm. things um, but but Mark, one, one of the things I was, sorry i'm probably rambling on but one of the things which is quite interesting is what marvin said it's really interesting is he, he wanted to show an interest in things and actually too often sports people don't um they they will sort of bury their heads or just get on with it yeah. but actually it's important to have a really good team around you but i try to always influence or make sure the people i work with you know understand what they're doing what yeah. they've got where their money is and all of those types yeah. of things because their mum won't be around at some point in yeah. the future or their partner might or whatever it might be or their agents and so on so at some point they're going to have to take control for themselves it is interesting interesting though because i get i guess there's a bit of a tension between needing to be authentic as you say joe and making sure you trust your people around you but also probably wanting to maximize your earnings on the back of say a, a big competition and i can imagine there is a, a bit of a pressure on them to wanting to take opportunities as and when they come and not wanting to miss the boat for element of fomo for example of course and you have to be sensible about that and say look now's your time but you've got to think about longevity like I said to you what's the point in committing yourself to 10 brands this year and then you're overexposing yourself everyone's a bit bored of you none of it's quite authentic you don't enjoy it more than you know primarily and you get a bit lost like Marv Marvin's great because like you said he's stubborn so he kind of probably knew himself and I'm really lucky I think my clients know themselves really well. So they know what they want. They know what they don't want. And I'm just here to say, this looks good. This doesn't look good. Yeah. Strategically, let's do this. Yeah. But they're very strong-minded, great characters. Yeah. I think if you, if you max out, yeah, you can, but you can max out and still make money, but still be around in five or 10 years mm. and invest that money properly yeah. while you do it. You don't have yeah. to max out and be exhausted. You know, the other thing we've got to consider is, they're still playing yeah so we are you know ultimately that bit comes first everything on this side is subsidiary to that mm -hmm. so you have to be mindful of the minute you're doing all this endorsement investment business stuff the minute they're not performing on the pitch yeah, yeah. you're getting the blame yeah so you've got to be really mindful of that yeah so how do you guys as advisors i'd love to hear your, your take on this as well Marvin. but how do you guys as advisors then scout out the opportunities for your athlete clients are you guys leading the charge on the due diligence side of things and then put only in front of your clients things that you think knowing them they'll be interested in or is it more collaborative how does it work in in practice i, I mean you know from my side as an initial starting point we won't go specifically with anything and you know we like to lay a foundation and that's you know the more conventional looking after your money and making sure you're going to be secure because ultimately any type of investment that we're speaking about here has a greater risk it's more condensed because you're investing in one place so you can lose everything and you know Joe made a really good point that actually as soon as you get into that spiral of worrying about off-field stuff it will affect your performance on it yeah. so the first thing is actually you know get, get the basics in place and then actually understand if they want to do stuff and then try to work out what interests them is it property is it tech is it alternatives is, is it brands clothing those types of things and then sort of go down that route you know and then at that point i would bring in you know you guys and, and a tax advisor to then sort of look through the company and do the due diligence in more detail then yeah. Interesting. Joe, what about you? Um, so, yeah, from our point of view, we all clients have a strategy. So, you know, I can sit and say, well, we look after four lionesses, but they're so unique in their own way. They all have their own what they want to do, what they're interested in. So, you know, I've got a list on the strategy of the brands that X player wants to work with. So I know 
So we'll either be approaching that brand or that company and saying, we're really interested in doing a bit of this. Would you like a chat? Yeah, great. So we'll have that meeting. Or obviously stuff is coming in all the time. So we meet, you know, I'll listen to everything. I'll read everything. You know, I've got a great team of eight in the business. So it's not, you know, it's not just all me. Mm. Everyone's looking at everything. This looks good. We have a policy that we do run everything past the client because my worst nightmare is that it's your mum's brother's son who works at said brand and I've turned it down. It's not even got in front of my client and they see them at, you know, Sunday dinner and your agent didn't even do this. So Mm -hmm. I will always, everything is seen by the client, but it's very much, right, here's the list. I mean, we had um, one of the players in yesterday. It's probably like a four hour hour meeting because it's three pages of requests. Um, And you're going, right, here's the front page. These are the ones that we think look interesting, look good. Mm -hmm. We've had, we already had the initial meeting. This is the fee. This is what you're doing. This is what the commitment is. And then the last page is, here's the other stuff that's come in. If there's a brand on there or there's a person on there that you want to do and you want me to go back to, I can, but I advise not. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, like, so then that bit all happens. And then it's, if I'm, you know, I'd ask a lawyer to help us with the next bit if we need. Yeah. What about you, Marvin? Because obviously you approached your, your kind of next stage after your career um, from the other side of things so you said that you know you you broke your mum in to, to help you but how did you go about identifying sort of your opportunities interestingly to be honest I just tried a lot of different things so probably from the age of about 21 I was always interested in what else I could do beyond football because you know I used to get home at one o'clock mm-hmm. and sit there and go well I can't just sit here every day watching tv or playing video games it doesn't really do anything for me it's not going to help me grow as a person and at some point I'm going to have to finish playing football so at that time I was learning to play the piano I was learning to speak Spanish I was learning to fly I was writing poetry I then began exploring filmmaking and I wanted to try all of these different things to understand what do I like what don't I like because that's only that's the only real way you're going to be able to start building something is if you actually understand the ins and outs of different spaces and Luckily, I've, I kind of fell into filmmaking and I also have a marketing agency, so which is interesting because I sit kind of in between probably what both of you do and also on the brand side of things. And, you know, your point on authenticity is such an interesting one because a lot of the conversations I have when it comes to anything that brands want to do with athletes or, or players in, in any capacity, I always go back and say, no, they're not going to want to do that because I know because I've sat in that position, so I know what is going to be of interest, what is going to make sense, how you're going to piece things together. Everything has to feel organic and authentic. And we're living in a time now where people can see through it very, very easily. When it, We're living in such a saturated market when it comes to advertising, um, marketing, branding, anything of that sort. So the things that are real have to, you know, they, they do massively stand out. And the things that are not real, mm-hmm. they, they massively stand out. So yeah. it's interesting that I can see in that position now and then, when it comes to investing, the biggest thing I did is invest in myself, you know, because if you do know what you like, then you can start building a career in that space and you can start then getting commercial opportunities and you can exchange commercial opportunities for equity in times. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to just be, right, I'm uh, an athlete, a Premier League football player. I'm going to put X amount of money into yeah. that business and allow that to grow. Mm-hmm. It's how do I actively make that business grow as well because if I have a name and I have a brand on my own and I can push that brand and I can push that that investment up then that's beneficial to me yeah and it's beneficial to the brand so I think it's interesting sitting in kind of in the in the middle space to be honest because at times I'm still in the bracket of talent athlete and in marketing and in as a you know content creator as a filmmaker And so being able to see how these conversations happen and understand what makes the most sense. And every single deal is completely bespoke. They're so hybrid that it just makes, it just just depends on what makes best sense in that situation. And, you know, sometimes it is a case of, I actually don't really like the brand that much, but you're going to give me a lot of money. So, you know, that's going to be what makes sense or, if I really believe in the brand and the, the cause behind it and the story behind it, then it makes sense to be involved in, as part of this journey, as yeah. opposed to just taking money. Yeah. So yeah. it's 
it's a fun position to be in, to be honest. No, it's, a, it's a, an amazing position to be in from your perspective, because of course you have both sides of the, um, the, the scene, don't you? It's, that's really cool. So like Martin said, it makes you far more, when a brand comes and you genuinely believe in the cause yeah. or you believe in that they're trying to do something a bit different or it's just quite interesting, it makes it much easier for both sides because it's not just then about the fee. Yeah. So you're saying like, yeah, if a company comes and it's lots of money, you've got to look at it. You'd be stupid not to. But actually if the, so in my case, the client, but Marvin for himself or when he's advising people, if they are genuinely, this is really interesting and they're doing something interesting in the space, it's much easier yeah. from the brand's point of view to offer something they might not have the money, yeah. but actually, look, we're growing and we want you to grow with us. Yeah. And that is actually quite interesting for all. But I find yeah. that yeah. stuff far more interesting than we've got this much money and we just need yeah. this amount of appearances and six social posts and done. Yeah. Because then I feel like well, you're just using the athlete. As yeah. I get it. It's yeah. fine. It yeah. works. Yeah, it's very yeah. so transactional. And there's no. What's yeah. the point? And the other way around, you know, if you pick up two of the things that Joe and Marvin have just said, you know, if. If you don't, if you're going to look for investment opportunities, you need to decide what what you what you're investing in. Mm. If you're looking to just make some money, fine, but you need to find something. If you're looking for a longer type of investment, that you have passion in, mm. because if you don't, you get bored of it. Yeah. Because most sports people are young people, and their lives will move on. So it'll be something you'll do, and then it'll get shut down. Or people will know that you're just taking money from a brand. Or the other way around, you know, the media. If that brand isn't a good brand, you've seen it with crypto recently where, where <coughs> people have just tried to take some money quickly you know and they've been linked to an nft or whatever it might be and then their image is tarnished yeah. so it's not it, you know there, there there are more things to think about rather than just money and an investment opportunity it's actually you know what is the longevity the reputational risk for the athlete and actually the long-term interest in that investment yeah no absolutely and i think so in terms of the kind of the legal side, you know, you can due diligence a company to the hills, but if the, you don't have that cultural alignment with the brand, with the company, that can be where you fall out because the reputational aspect of the company doing something that tarnishes the athlete or the athlete doing something off pitch that tarnishes the brand can be where these investments fall down. Joe, when you said um, about kind of strategic advisory sort of athletes wanting to get involved in the company, what does that look like on a day to day? Does it look like, for example, taking a board seat or is it more a kind of commercial agreement sort of a couple of days a month? What, what, how do these things work out um, in practice? We've not done a board seat, but I am actually talking to someone about a board thing. So that's interesting that you bring that up because that's obviously the ultimate is, look, we want this deal. But if you we ultimately want to drive your business yeah. from the top so that's we're actually doing one of those at the moment um yeah generally it's a couple of days we'll come into the office and you are basically being paid as a consultant mm -hmm. as a business consultant would be which i think it's a new way that companies are thinking of athletes because traditionally you go footballer stereotype of footballer but now people are understanding lived experience people are bright and they bring something you know, diverse thinking makes everything better. So get different people in the room who are bringing something different to the party um, and lots more brands are being open to that. So yeah, it's internal, it's, you know, it's not spoken about, this is not something they can use. They cannot say our oh, strategic consultant is this person. It's just very much, we're doing this because the client wants to, my client wants to help you and you want to listen to, you know, you don't have, an ex-athlete in your company which is another growing area lots of companies are realizing that they should employ ex-athletes because they have so much to offer yeah. but if you don't have that sort of person in the room but you're trying to sell in their sport or sell to their audience or their fans be very sensible to have them in the room um i think that goes to your point marvin which is you can offer such an interesting difference so then some of the advisors, not for one second throwing shade over you two, but you have a different insight into this yeah. because of your background and your career. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've sat in many rooms in many, and had many conversations around board tables and, you know, with often, you know, brands, businesses, governing bodies get together and they have conversations about what's going to happen. What are these athletes going to do? What they're going to say, how we're going to make a difference their face is going to be on it. All of, all of the impact is going to be on them. And I sit and often say, you know, it's, it's easy for us to sit here as you know, puppet masters, essentially, and just say, oh, they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. 
how many of them have you spoken to? How many of them are you thinking about in terms of the output? How, how much do you understand of their world that you're going to understand how to speak to them yeah. and allow them to speak to the people that you want to speak to? Mm -hmm. Because it's essentially just using them as vessels. Yeah. And so you have to understand who, they, who they're going to be speaking to and understand the language that, so that can just be seamless. Mm -hmm. But often that is lost. Mm -hmm. But also there's yeah. so many things that Marvin to you will just be, well, of course it's like that. Or yeah. it's yeah. so much, there's so much knowledge that someone like Marvin will have yeah. from 20 years as a player, 30 years as a player, mm -hmm. that you won't even know the value of that experience. Yeah. And then when you speak about it, you go, oh God, I didn't even, I didn't realise that. I didn't know that. And we see it a lot in women's football in that yeah. they, there's so much that people don't understand about, like, they, there's the two sides. Half, of, half people think they're all earning millions of pounds and they've got millions of pounds to invest in every business going and would your player like to invest? Like, they're still not at that earning level yet. But the other half don't quite realise that they're professional athletes and they have a schedule. So we'll get requests in, right, could we have them on March the 9th at 1 p.m.? And I'll be like, well, no, because they'll be in training. Yeah. Well, what about the next day? Well, no, because they'll be in training. <laughs> well, how many days a week do they train? Well, every day apart from one day off. And that might be recovery or they, you know, it's, it's both sides. Whereas to Marvin, that's just, well, of course I'm in training five days, yeah. six days a week. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much value from bringing that person in that it, it doesn't have to be transactional yeah. as in I'll pay you to be this external facing. Yeah. Actually, I'd much rather you were a consultant. I'd much rather you can help my business so much more strategically than you possibly can externally. Yeah. Saves money that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so it's interesting for you. It's fun. Yeah. Like, and it, talking about, you know, what is your, what is your career? What, how are you, how are you going to earn a living when you retire? Well, actually I can, I know stuff that yeah. lots of people in the sports business wouldn't have a clue about because they've never done what you've done mm -hmm. and what do you are you finding brands sort of looking to enter into strategic partnerships with athletes is that becoming more of a trend are you finding more than I suggested I don't know really we yeah we've not I don't think anyone's ever come I'm trying to think possibly one or two but it's generally we've offered it as a I don't really want my client doing personal appearances 24-7 yeah. when they're a current athlete yeah, or yeah. a current manager. So when, so when a brand approaches you, what is there a sort of a typical offer that they're offering to an athlete? Is it, is it these traditional endorsement social style? Media. Yeah, social deals, posts. Social posts, <laughs> is it? Yeah, some Instagram posts, please. Lots of Instagram posts, like, oh, boring. Um, yeah, Instagram posts. And still, actually, media interviews. They still yeah. love the power of a media interview. Um, but I'm like, well, should we just talk about the message you're trying to get across yeah. and why first? And what are brands giving in return for these posts? Are they giving cash? Are they giving shares? Are they giving cash. something else? Cash. Yeah. Generally. Quite, yeah. Is it? Social is yeah. still very basic. Yeah. yeah. And do you think, is that across genders, across sports, across everything or is there a, I think so. is, yeah is that i think we're, we're still at a very early stage of like proper brands doing actual brand work where they you know building a real purpose and identity from the ground up mm -hmm. we saw a lot of this obviously over the last few years with so many different social yeah. issues but you can see they're just they're <laughs> like just paper and over cracks you know really? and i think the real when we when we really start to see it it's still going to be years down the line where like you have like real proper like endorsement deals of tra of traditional will be like very much more hybrid deals where you know they are going in to say this is what I believe in this is what I'm passionate about yeah. this is how it can be weaved into the into the brand into the company yeah and that's how you're going to come back into this community into and to you know everything's about profit of course yeah. but this is how you can profit from it as well yeah. and so from that point strategic um, opportunities will naturally come up yeah. at some point but you know it takes people like Joe to push that because they're always going to think in what has worked before yeah. we're just going to keep doing the same thing if it doesn't work one time it's probably going to work the next time because it's worked in the past yeah. whereas the world is moving in a very different direction yeah. and the I guess the the brands who are wise enough to clock onto it the quickest yeah. will profit the most yeah, yeah. 
What about you, Adam? What, what's it, does a brand sort of approach you with a with a stock sort of offer for your clients, or I, I, what I mean, do you I, think? I, I don't really get brands coming to me. That, that that's not really my role. That they, they would go through Joe in that yeah. type of thing. My, mine is just is will be generally businesses and investment right. opportunities yeah. rather than you know a brand coming and say you know we want to link up with this footballer. Right. I think, you know, just touching on these points, what's interesting is the reality is, you know, the endorsement deal is in its most simplistic view. Or you have a company, they want to make more money and they think by Marvin smiling and, and, and saying something, it's going to make them more money. And that's yeah. all they're trying to do. So yeah. rather, I mean, the, I suppose the one interesting one around the branding and, and, and the partnership, if you think is like probably prime drink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know we, yeah i mean <laughs> which i didn't know they sold at the emirates no, no, and no. i was very excited i'm mean, yeah. a spurs fan so yeah. but, but arsenal were playing but, but chelsea it, women but it, sell it but it's really interesting because my, my son's 11 and he thinks ksi is famous because of prime he thinks wow. that's what's made wow. him famous and i had to sort of actually talk <laughs> him through the fact that you know the youtube and he's just you know don't but that's probably where you you know that's probably the biggest most recent right. thing where you would think that actually it's just leveraging what you have isn't it? yeah yeah but like and the greatest example yeah. is michael jordan yeah, yeah. and like yeah. every athlete should look at michael jordan as the best example of yeah. leveraging their name and their likelihood mm -hmm. to, to to profit because at the end of the day if someone comes to me and goes here's a million dollars or here's a million pounds my i shouldn't my first it sh shouldn't be oh wow that's so much money it should be hold on if you have a million pounds to give me how much have you got? And also, what is that going to turn into? Yeah. He's not going to give it to me for no reason. I don't think people realised until now in the last few years, actually, that Jordan deal mm. with Nike and actually what it represented yeah. and what yeah. it was. Yeah. It completely changed, like, sports marketing, yeah. branding and athlete endorsements, like, forever. Yeah. Like, in a massive way. But it's still going now. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. my son's obsessed, again, with, yeah. with Jordan. It's a big comeback, hasn't it? Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're looking at investment opportunities, then what do they look like from your clients' perspectives? Ex external co companies. It, <laughs> so, you know, I've seen anything and everything. You know, yeah. I've seen people come trying to sell car park spaces in Glasgow Airport as an investment <laughs> no. opportunity to long term rent. No, I have, honestly, because it's a footballer and they think it's a really good investment opportunity. <laughs> Barrels of oil. We saw one that was really interesting, which went wrong, where, again, it was a footballer through a footballer and it was this new sort of tech that you could that, that you could do security through through hotels, voice recognition. You could order room service. You could use it through Ringo. You could use it at home. You could use it to call the police. And it was really really smart. And yeah. the guy that got introduced to the footballer was ex police, and his partner was linked to Google in some way. So you're like, it's a bit of credibility here. Mm -hmm. And then we we sort of had this conversation, and it sounded really interesting when they pitched. And then the footballer was very interested in understanding more about business. So we sat together with him, with a tax advisor, with a lawyer, and we sent a very basic due diligence document mm. to this company. And they, they basically came back and said, NA, or not answering this to 85% of the really simplistic <laughs> questions, which were, can they become a board member? Really? Can they reinvest more? What are the opportunities for buyouts and so on? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it was like, NA, NA, do you own you know, the, the patenting and the naming rights? No, we don't. We basically just borrow it off Alexa. And it was, really? basic, so it was basically a facade. Yeah. And then the, the company were then texting the client, asking if they could just meet for a coffee. And I want you to know that, you know, right, really? okay, this is, yeah. this is done. So there's loads of things and there's loads of kissing frogs. And again, for me, I touched on it before, you get loads of stuff chucked your way, mm. but it's about sitting down with the footballer. It's not about, right, do you just want to make some money? Because you can make some money and you can punt on stuff. But actually, what do you want to do? What interests you? What's the long term? You know, is it investing in the film industry? Does yeah. that thing interest you? Is it investing in TV? Is it tech? Yeah. And then we'd try to go out and try and find things yeah. that, that might fit that space through people mm. we know. We've, um, I obviously, so I have an Adam in my life who does that side of stuff. But we've had like, our clients have got quite interesting ones, like a black skincare cream. Mm -hmm. um, There's a really interesting woman who set up like fast halal food. So in supermarkets, you know, like ready meals. Mm -hmm. And um, she basically started it at home. So one of our clients invests in that. So like, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's nothing to do with, and that's not, it's not external facing at all. Mm -hmm. It is literally investment because you go 
that's a really great idea and yeah. it's really needed in the market so there's loads of it i mean you must yeah, get i've got, so I've got, got to invest in a vegan vegan restaurant in brighton yeah. because it's really popular that you know mm. that type of mm. vegan is popular everywhere now but it was it was taking off down there so i you know for me it's that they've got to have an interest in whatever they're investing in rather than it right if you do this you can make money from yeah. it Definitely. It does sound very much like there's no one size that fits all for any athlete, any agent, any advisor. And really, it's about the opportunity at that time based on all the circumstances. That's why it's the best job in the world, because no day is the same. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess from an advisor's perspective, that makes your job a bit more difficult because you have to have such you know, in-depth knowledge of what your client's interested in, what they're looking for, kind of culturally as well as kind of financially as well. In order to yeah. weed out the no, you do. But if you're like, I sounds really cringy, but I'm like, my clients are my family. Like yeah. I love them. Like I'm their mum, and so you do know them. Um, but also, a lot of it is just common sense. Mm. You know, I'm not saying everyone can do this, but it's not brain science. Mm. It's read the proposal. Is it interesting? Does it fit said client? Mm -hmm. And it's not a one size fits all at all. Yeah. It's not the the interesting one is where they go. We would just like a female athlete to be the face of this and you go you haven't really thought about this have you mm. because what's unique to that athlete um but yeah I think it is just keeps it interesting yeah common sense read it slowly you know you're all lawyers you'll know <laughs> you know you'd be far better at this than I am um yeah take each thing individually so on the subject of advice then Marvin what would you what piece of advice or pieces of advice would you give to your younger self when looking at kind of next steps and opportunities? Um, to be honest, I wish I listened less to people. Really? Yeah, definitely. Because I stopped doing a lot of those things I said. I stopped looking at a lot of the things I was interested in because I listened to people, a lot of people in the football industry who basically just said concentrate on football. And if I didn't just concentrate on football, I would have done a lot more interesting things and I would have been further down the line in my career path trajectory really? now. So oh. yeah, that's definitely one, <laughs> to be honest. But um, I think to anybody really, I guess to people who are working with any athletes to, to push them to explore, because I think that's so important because as I said, investing in myself is the biggest investment I could have ever made because I knew then where I wanted to go mm. and what I wanted to do. And so I would definitely advise anyone to advise their athletes to explore because then you know which direction you want to go in, you know what you're interested in, you know where you can really focus your energy because that's really the main thing because in the end of the day, everybody can have bucket loads of money, but if you have no purpose or anything behind it, what's the point? Yeah. And, and, and the point about the no purpose behind it is, is important because it's a really short career in football. Yeah. It goes through really quickly. You know, you, you, your whole life from a very early age is routine and set out mm. and then it stops and the club spit you out mm. and then you've got to get on with life and you're not used to that routine. So it's what have you got? You know, yeah. what, what's, what's your passion or what are you interested in? So, so, so it's really important to do that. Mm. What about you, Joe? If you had one piece of advice for your athlete clients when they're sort of embarking on their sort of opportunities, what would you say? What's your thing? Mm. Like, what's your? I always say to clients when they come, like if they want to sign with us, I go like, what's your? What's the? What's your purpose? Like, you're a footballer, that's amazing, and you're an athlete, that's amazing. But what's the point of you? So, what's the point in having a platform if you're not using it? And that's not just. I don't just mean politically or you know charity work. Or I mean, what's your purpose in life? Like, who are you? Mm. So it's kind of know that and if you don't know that that's fine we can help you explore that but i think it's really important to know your passion or your yeah. i call it your purpose like yeah. oh, it sounds awful what's the point of you that sounds terrible but it's <laughs> what's you know you've got this amazing talent this amazing platform and this amazing opportunity to be some you know be something yeah. so how are we going to use it mm. well, what about you adam I mean, the one, the one thing when I work with all sports people or all clients, especially in the sports space, is, is just to say you've got a very short career. You've got an incredible life. You've got an incredible opportunity. 
you can do all the things you want to do, but always have one eye on the future because it's going to be over very, very quickly. Yeah. And if you're sensible, you'll have the best life yeah. and do all the things that you want to do post-career. Yeah. What I'm hearing this all kind of boil down to is a sense of self and authenticity is really the driver. And you can be blinded by cash. I mean, we all are sometimes. But if you don't believe in it, there isn't cultural alignment between you and the opportunity, then that really kind of stifles things. I think that's where longevity comes from. Yeah. You know, you, every money can come and go very, very quickly, changes hand very fast. So I think that's where you can build longevity and football doesn't offer that. Mm. So <laughs> something else has to. Yeah. But it can evolve. Yeah. You know, it's not like what you say at 21, your purpose is, is your purpose when you're 35. Yeah. yeah. It's an evolving thing. You know what? We always say our strategies are evolving strategies. It's not like, I wrote it 10 years ago and we're still sticking to that because yeah. you said you wanted to do this. <laughs> like Marvin's career, exactly. You know, like what you did even five years ago, yeah. we were talking about it earlier is, well, actually now I've realised there's this massive, you know, on the production side or you've got the marketing side, but you've got the production side and actually you go through sort of waves, don't you, of yeah. this is this is here now, but actually well, the production is really interesting now and I can make more impact there. Yeah. So it is, it's a whole evolving process. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of sort of where you see the space kind of going in the next few years, is there any, do you have any kind of insight for trends? Have you got any kind of predictions for where you see sort of athlete investment landing? I think we're going to get to a stage of athletes pushing more for equity, hybrid deals, okay. things that benefit them more, things yeah. that are less transactional where they just get given cash. Yeah, I think the American model is, with their athletes is something that we're obviously trying to, mm. to catch up to. But, you know, there are great examples over there, like you, you saw on the, um, presented on the slides earlier, where yeah. so many athletes were wise enough to think about the longevity of a deal as opposed to just, you know, a number on a piece of paper and some appearances. Yeah. And also cultural alignment is going to be a huge factor, I think. over. I think it already is, but I think it's only going to continue to grow in that space where people will only work with, things and people that they are aligned with because it just won't make sense otherwise um, we were talking about this earlier actually I'd say like content ownership and sort of ownership so athlete ownership of everything but you know I'll, as I sort of said earlier in previous times you'd just rock up and everyone else was deciding editorially what you were doing and visually what you were doing so sort of bringing all of that in-house and having all your ownership so you, you know, you're the brand rather than just being an athlete, you sort of have ownership. Um, and then more purposeful on both sides. So athletes are understanding that you can't just align yourself with something for the sake of it. Mm. And I think actually, <coughs> much as I gave some brands a hard time earlier, <laughs> generally everybody is moving with the right, who is the right person for this and how do we make that work best for both of us? Yeah. So I think yeah. athlete control. Yeah. That's interesting. And I guess it goes back to a previous point, um, which is about recognising as well that athletes got a full time job in addition to trying to curate their image for future endorsement later on. It's kind of quite a difficult one, right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of full time. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where that is really interesting, you know, with the time thing, especially I'd say, you know, I started working with some boxers recently and actually, you know, when they're in and around training camp, mm. that, that's actually when the brands and so on want them. And it's okay. the, you know, that's actually the time when they actually don't or, or shouldn't be going any near where any brand, yeah, because their risk in their job is significantly yeah. greater yeah. than yeah. football, yeah. you know, because <laughs> you get knocked out and hurt yeah. quite yeah. badly. And but, but but actually, I've seen that with a couple of quite high profile boxers where you know, as you get closer to a fight, they have more and more brands wanting to drag them in, you, you know, two things which actually you touched upon before about what they're mm. doing and understanding what they're doing on a day to day basis. Mm. But predictions for the space, Alan? I, so so I, I agree with what everyone's saying. And I think part of the reason that these things will become more, more available or more in demand from the athletes is because there's more money in the game yeah. in, in, in both women's and men's football. So actually the athletes, I think, can demand it because they don't need it. Mm -hmm. Whereas like five, ten years ago, when there was still a lot of money, but less money, you take maybe more what you could get. Whereas now actually yeah. you can say, well, I don't, 
I don't need to work with that brand. So actually, what am I getting? Yeah. Um, so I think that's where you'll see those. Uh, the culture thing, I definitely agree with. And yeah. one thing we haven't touched upon, which I don't really want to talk about, but I think you'll see more involvement for sure into like um, NFTs. Okay. And that's where people's own brands will, I think, evolve that's sort of into that space. That's right. and on top of that as well, social media is a massive factor. One of the reasons why probably athletes go, I don't necessarily need a brand because I can endorse yeah. myself because yeah. I've got my own platform to do so. Which so like the ownership thing. Yeah. yeah. They've got a voice that yeah. they weren't given before. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a massive thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which platform, which kind of social media platform do you think is most important? Um, it depends what's going what how does the wind blow you know, yeah it I changes guess. i mean i don't I, I know tiktok's obviously massive i don't use tiktok i don't know if anyone in this room uses tiktok like actively uses it Dance i know it no one's gonna put their hands up but <laughs> <laughs> there's people in this room that use TikTok. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll leave it at that but like that's obviously a massive one most brands are still looking for at instagram because visual platform yeah. as opposed to twitter which is more information based TikTok, of course, is slightly longer form. There's obviously YouTube Shorts. Yeah. There's a million different yeah, streaming yeah, yeah. platforms. There's, yeah. you know, Snapchat's obviously now coming back, which I didn't even realise. Yeah, Snapchat's coming back again. Uh -huh. More the TikTok generation. So that's another interesting what are you saying one. About me? <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not for me for sure. I don't know. I don't know anything about TikTok. Someone asked me about TikTok. I'm like, ask someone else. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, any questions from the audience for any one of these lovely panelists? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, this is kind of a question directed to everyone up there. Uh, you kind of mentioned it at the end, or you touched upon it, that you think that, uh, well, you hope that we're kind of pushing towards a similar scene that there is in the US with regards to the endorsements. Um, what do you think it is that is the reason that there's such a big difference? Because um, is it just that there's more people in America and therefore uh, there's more money to go around? Is it the whole um, kind of view on sports, more the fact that in America, um, high school kids are being actively scouted and so they're getting um, these massive lifetime endorsement contracts from the day they become pro and recently now even in college what do you think is the like the main reason for the difference and what do you think we need to do here to kind of reach that level and finally will we reach that level exactly or will it be kind of a proportional uh like proportional level in comparison to the, the size of the business i mean i find that really interesting because that's something that as a player, former player, I look at a lot. And I mean, probably the biggest difference is that in America, they have football, which is, you know, if we look at football in comparison to one of their sports, they have it across five or six different sports and a much bigger market. So of course, they're going to be ahead of us. They also had Michael Jordan, who, you know, set the, the framework for everything else to come. I think one thing in football that probably sets us behind is that player power isn't a thing in this country. Whereas in America, all of the power is within the players. If something isn't right, the players come together and say, yeah, we're not playing. Doesn't matter what you say, we say, we're not playing. Whereas in this country, it's very easy for, you know, for players to just kind of be pushed aside or use this, like put pit against each other for any protest in, you know, protest in a way to be stopped. One big thing is that the PFA at the moment is a very weak organization. I'm very open to say that I sit on the players board and I'll say, I'll say that in, in our meetings that as, all, as an organization, we're very weak at the moment. And that's because of everything that's happened previous. All of the power sits within the Premier League and each individual club. So until players have that level of power collectively, not through the clubs, but through the union, because it's what the PFA is, it's a, it's a union, then we're, we're never going to get there to be honest you know so it's hard to say what will happen I mean the union is changing and heading in a more positive direction which is good because you know, we weren't just stagnant before we were heading in the wrong direction for like I don't know what four decades mm -hmm. <laughs> so so it's, it's you know there's a lot of change to, to be made but I think social media plays a massive part in accelerating that because so many players, I think Marcus Rashford is obviously a massive example, Raheem Sterling, of people who have taken ownership of their own voice. And that is the first step. You know, if you take ownership of your voice and your story, then 
you dictate what you do, you, you dictate what happens, but there isn't quite enough of that yet. I'd say um, kind of a couple of points that football wasn't trendy in this country. Like football wasn't attractive commercially. We had a massive hooligan issue. It was a you know low to middle class sport and it wasn't on television. Whereas if you look at like the NFL or, or basketball or even baseball, it was huge in America. So brands got in there from day dot. Whereas brands didn't come into football till, well, when did we start liking football? 1990, Italia 90, I don't know, 96 even. That's when brands went, oh, these people could sort of be heroes. And, you know, we were still having hooligan problems. So I think we've just been behind on that um, level. And then in terms of women's sport, really different because the Americans were professional and brilliant. Um, you know, they were successful and women's football here, we weren't successful because we didn't have any sort of professionalism. So I think we're just a little bit behind on all fronts, but football is one of those sports that wasn't attractive. It wasn't, certainly wasn't a, really a family sport, was it, 30 years ago? Um, so, I, you know, I think it's, it's twofold. I think also, the, you know, the, the, the other point about the hooliganism, and you know, at that time as well, a lot of footballers were just out, you know, boozing a lot, weren't they? So they weren't, they weren't you know, they're not the athletes that they are now. So yeah. did you actually want to be endorsed with, exactly. yeah. you, you, you know, like an alcoholic footballer as an example? I think the other thing I think in America, um, the, the big stars, NFL, NBA, get paid significantly more than football. Yeah. Um, it, it's a much greater market. And I think also, I think in here, we're more cynical about branding, branding as well. Whereas I think in America, it's like, if you yeah. put Michael Jordan's face up with something, yeah. they love it. Whereas I think the British people are a bit more, this market's a bit more cynical with stuff like that. Do you, reckon, do you reckon that's right from a, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you see it from a very much a media perspective in terms my, of the narrative. My favorite one is Jamie Redknapp and Sketches. Oh, like, hey. like, even, like, even like my son at like 10 years old, like he doesn't wear those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that's because things have happened so quickly and everyone's just like, our oh, football's interesting now, like women's football now. It's like, let's just jump in and throw loads of money at it and let's just get yeah. faces. Yeah. And then people go, yeah, but I don't know. It's like, you know, you watch a show and you go, would they really use that? Would they, you know, yeah. would they actually? Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. think they would. Yeah. Whereas like, because of social media as well now, we're getting more used to understanding who these people are. Yeah. And so we can actually identify, ah, I know that person. Exactly. That. How do you know Jamie doesn't wear skirts? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you see his nice shoes yeah, on sky. Yeah, yeah. So, you yeah. know, we do, we do understand yeah. it. Whereas 20 years ago, we were probably right, scraping right, this. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? That gentleman at the back, I think. Not Tom. <laughs> I haven't got my glasses that's on. Not so right. We've got some, uh, some questions from the q and I thought I'd ask, ask those ones, that's okay. Um, so one of the ones that came in was, do you think there'll be more instances of footballers or retired players becoming investors in football clubs, as we've seen the case with Fabregas at Como in the class of 92 in Salford City? Uh, and the second question was for Adam, was um, I saw that even partners have partnered with 258 Management. Uh, he seems to really have taken the lead in terms of his investments. Is this option only available to boxers at the highest point in their careers? So can I answer question two first? Do that one first before we forget it. Yeah, I forgot. It was I forgot. I forgot. But but the point about the boxing. Um, so so if I just touch on that, it's just a bit of a plug for, for what we're doing. But um, so we did a lot of work in football. We do a lot around um, education, um, especially in for for young football and young young sports people academies. And, and again, we try to educate the athletes that we work with about post career and money and so on. And we started doing some work in boxing. And, you know, edu financial education doesn't exist. So um, we, we created a, a program specifically for boxers and we created it with, we created it, we spoke to numerous companies and 258 Management wanted to partner with us. 258 Management, if you don't know, is the, um, the, um, the management company that Anthony Joshua owns. And actually the, the, the program that we rolled out was sort of less so for him, but more for the athletes that he looks after. And that was because they um, care about their athletes. They want to be different because in boxing, it's a bit of a weird world. You have, you know, your promoters like Matchroom and Queensbury, and actually their job is to, is to basically get TV deals and promote a fight, but not look after the athletes. Mm. You have 
lawyers involved, profs do a great job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then generally there's a vacuum of, of, of a boxer will go in to um, a gym and his trainer will end up being his manager who advises him on maybe what to do with his money, which is a really weird concept where in football you have an agent who maybe get involved and then they would introduce so what 258 have done is they've created a management agency that sits quite nicely to sort of help offer that service so a lot of what we're doing is not you know for for high level boxes it's, it, it's for everybody because it's the same concept i spoke about before you've got a very short career you may earn very good money you may not but actually what can you do along the way to make sure you look after your money I have no idea what the first question was. I've got the first one. <laughs> yeah. so the first question was, are we going to see more footballers um, investing in football clubs? Yeah. Which, um, yes, absolutely. And yes, absolutely. It would be brilliant if we could. Um, we, so I'm, apart from my day job, I'm a director of Women in Football, which is an organisation for any male or female working in football. But it is effectively to champion and train and educate and elevate um, females in the industry. And part of the reason for that is there are very, very, very few women at board level, certainly very few women who own football clubs. And there is, going back to the point where I was saying earlier about, you know, having a Marvin in your office to mm. educate you or give you strategic advice, this is exactly what we need at football clubs. But it was such a closed shop for so many years that I think footballers just didn't even see the pathway. Mm. Um, I mean, we did something, so Jason Roberts has been a client for years and years, did a lot of work in this area while he was still playing and on the PFA board. And we did a get on board, effectively. We do it at Women in Football. It's, you know, how to get on a board. We do board training um, and lots of sort of C-suite level training. But it was to get you board ready, effectively. So Jason did, did the one for male footballers and effectively women in football. We, we do it for any female working in the industry because it's so valuable. And, I mean, how many people make money running a football club? I'm not sure about that bit. I'm not sure you'd be advising people, mm -hmm. but you know, there is there is a value to it, and also there's a value to the club from having ex pros mm. in the ranks. We just spoke about that with Marvin about the value of having him involved. It's, yeah, it, you know, it's actually if you think it logically, it's absolutely ridiculous that you don't have that senior level across clubs, Premier League, the FA, and so on. People like Marvin who've played the game, who know the game. It's crazy you know, because they've been there and they've done it. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't happen in any other business. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? There's a guy at the back who's had his hand up a few times. Sorry, Sorry I've got my glasses. <laughs> it shouldn't be me deciding it. But so I, felt, <laughs> I, felt, I felt bad for you. <laughs> Very interesting. I think something that uh, inspired the question was uh, what Marvin and Joe said. I mean, as a former chairman of a football club and a former elite athlete, and somebody who sits on boards and sports tech companies today advising sort of uh, the sort of whole platter of the sporting properties. I was uh, a couple of years ago involved in getting Mo Farah to do his first TED talk. And uh, very much in line with what Joe is saying, how important it is to actually get across your experience and your knowledge, which is not something that the sort of uh, business world in particular appreciates as much as it should. He actually then led to him being involved with a tech conference and eventually to a seven figure sort of a product endorsement deal with the same company who actually recognized and wanted a lot more from him than that. Today, interestingly, I was on the call to the guys in Saudi Arabia, Al Nasser, the signed Ronaldo and Ronaldo's uh, NFT agency. And we talked about a strategy in which 15 million extra followers actually uh, just uh, happened to, to be the case over the last month of uh, Ronaldo moving there. So, um, Having been interviewed after the collapse of FTX platform and having sort of advised the clubs, leagues, federations about the importance of doing the due diligence, how do you guys make sure when you are approached by all sorts of people in the blockchain space, where I often talk about that, you know, crypto is not blockchain, blockchain is not an NFT, it's a technology that's very important. How do you make these decisions? Because inevitably, there's a lot of money, actually, trillions of, of pounds, dollars and euros are going to be poured into the blockchain space. I think it's very important for the sporting properties and the agents that represent the, the sportsmen to know what they're doing, who to trust. And I think there is, a, at the moment, a very blanket approach. Any NFT proposal is turned down because everyone is basically linked to what's happening in the crypto market. And I think that's a, 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 a misconception. 
and misunderstanding and the lack of education across the board. So I just uh, would love to hear, obviously Marvin mentioned that towards the end, Joe, you all about sort of getting it right for your agents and I'd love to hear the answer from either of you. Um, <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't know enough about the crypto NFT space market, whatever you want to call it. So I personally don't touch it. I don't get involved in anything. If I can't explain something to somebody else very simply, then I won't get involved in it because it doesn't make sense for me personally. So um, that's probably the end of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting point because it has been coming up more and more and I'm really risk averse, but I would say I default to people who know more than me. So when it has happened and we've had a few NFTs in or various investment opportunities like that, I literally pick up the phone to, and that is the whole, you know, the whole point of having trusted people or those I respect in the industry. And it is literally call a few friends. Have you done one of these deals? What do you think of this? Tell me what I don't know. And then I'll do the lawyers. But it, first and foremost, I always just default to, you know, there is no point trying to pretend you know everything in this industry. And there are people who've been doing NFTs for three to five years who know far more than me. I wouldn't, my worst case is that I turn something down for my client that could have been a massive opportunity. So I would rather get every bit of information I can, um, but that is not always going to be in my four walls in my office. So yeah, I'll be honest, I call and phone a friend um, <laughs> and hope that they know more than me. Because, you know, it is, it's it, like you say, it's, you know, I'm naturally cynical of it. Um, it's not an area I've, I know much about, and I'm happy to admit that, but there are people that are doing it. I my point is I've not seen anyone do it that well or where I've gone, oh, that looked a really good deal. I wish I'd done that. So until I sort of see that, I'll probably remain a little bit cynical. Um, but it's one of those where it's my duty to phone around and see what people know. Mm. But it's a growing space. So it's something we should all be educating ourselves on. I'll take that. It's probably not the answer you wanted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're honest with that, uh, yeah. as, as, as Joe, as you said, it's a, it's a growing area and there are opportunities. I think everyone's got to be very, very careful and do the due diligence. I think it's just hard care. because you don't have a benchmark. So it's not like I can say, well, when I did this similar deal a year ago, it looked like this. Mm. You know, experience is, the, you know, the, the best thing we have to rely on. So if I don't have the experience, let me look at someone who, you know, looks after Ronaldo or looks after... You know the Wayne Mooney one or whichever it, it's kind of call your call your nice friends I think I think you need to look at it again you need to come back on the NFT space because we've got a specialist team who are working in this area and, and looking at it and our, our view on it at the minute is you know from an investment point of view it's not regulated you know that whole space so so we're a you know let's wait and that's going to happen in about two years when there's a change in um, the governor of the Bank of England because the governor of the Bank of England currently is the F the ex-head of the FCA so once that changes, there'll be a different view in the UK. Um, and, and, you know, our view is you're going to see, you're going to see stuff around similar to the tech boom of the late nineties, where loads of companies were about and they all went bust. And then you had like Yahoo, Google, and a couple of others that came out of it. And that's what will develop in the meta space. You've seen a lot of athletes for the exact reasons that the, these people have said, ha not having a strategy where everyone's come and said, invest in NFT, we create your own NFT, NFT and you get paid some money for doing it. And that's not the way to look at it. Um, it is to be more strategic, but I think the UK is very underdeveloped in that world at the minute and, and, and not there's not enough education, regulation and understanding of what lies behind, you know, these companies and so on. And until there's more control, regulation and understanding of who, who these businesses are, I think it's very much a sit and wait and it will develop out for sure and i think that's where i mentioned before you can create nfts as part of a long-term investment strategy for someone where they can control their own brand mm. in the future i think we will get go into that world mm. time for one more question sorry go on adam as you're the chief question picker. me <laughs> oh man I, you, you had your hat sorry sorry he, he had time up for you before so <laughs> sorry <laughs> Um, you know, I, I do a similar role to what Adam does today, but I was also 
at the London Olympics. Uh, but oddly enough, I actually have roomed with Moa Farah uh, at the World Championships, but that aside, um, a really, really simple question. What does the panel think about educating or guiding athletes to make better decisions with the advisors they have around them? That is incredibly important. You know, I sit here as a former athlete and I think I can I speak like this myself about different topics because of the fact that I personally wanted to look into different things and I took a lot of interest in it. And I think it should push more people, as I said right at the beginning, take every athlete needs to take control of their own lives and their own careers and you know, career, athletic career and, and beyond. So I think it's very important to educate them. A lot of times, you know, we're talking about people that come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, myself included. So that level of education in terms of, you know, finance, you know, tax, career, business is not just not there naturally. So, of course, you need to give people the tools needed to succeed in life beyond, you know, the career they're going to be stepping into. You know, this, the career of a professional athlete, football in particular, is very high rewarding or it can be very high rewarding it can put you in onto a pedestal and so there are so many you know positives and negatives to that and so understanding how to then use that as this not just like you know i've reached the top of the mountain and that's it it's like no this is a springboard to to take me through to the rest of my life that's really essentially the position that we want to be able to be in you know, something i've spoken about a lot with a lot of different governing bodies within football that essentially the whole um, education system that we have in place for scholars should be ripped up. It can be ripped up because it's government funded. Premier League doesn't need government to fund their education system. It can be so much better in terms of understanding financial literacy, um, life skills, business, you know, very fundamental basics that you may pick up from going to college, going to uni or just being around different people, whereas in football, now, I never went to college, I never went to uni. And unless I went and spent time going and having conversations with different people, the only people I would have spoke to for you know 15 years are football players. And if everyone of those people only ever spoke to football players, we're only going to speak about one thing. <laughs> so I think it's I think it's like vitally important. And again, like I you know I place massive emphasis on that for agents, for players, for anybody involved in football or, or sport in any way, because it can, re it can really be make or break, you know, in terms of career. And I, I speak a lot about mental health. And, you know, if you take someone all the way up there with their career and then all of a sudden the career finishes and you go, well, see you, good luck. You know, if they've been here for a long time and you just allow them to just drop, that is very dangerous, you know, and I think we also have a responsibility because everyone in this room profits from the fact that people are good at what they do in terms of being athletes, you know, whether it's, you know, commercial deals or player transfers or athlete investment, we all profit from the fact that they're good at what they do. And so I think we have a responsibility to then allow them to, you know, be good at other things and, and have a much more longevity in their life. I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think I mentioned to you before what, with one of the questions, you know, one of the main things that I do with everybody I work with is, is, is we, as, we as a business, we focus on education. So we don't just sit and work with the athletes, take them on as clients and look after their money. We go into the academies, we talk to young kids up and coming to educate them on real simplistic, basic financial matters, tax and so on. And there's this misconception with footballers especially that they're not smart, um, but that's because they have not been educated in the same way that, you know, some of us in this room have. They've never learned about the tax system and so on. So why should they ever know about it? So educating them, getting them to understand it is, is really important and getting them to take control of these things, you know, across all sports is fundamental because in the future, you know, they won't have their parents you know, they may or may not get married, whatever it might be. So it's, you know, it's really, it, you know, it's, it's a key part of what you do is making sure um, and, 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 you know, working as part of a team, you know, around them so that they make good decisions. Um, and yeah, with, with, with people I work with, I spend as much or as little time as they want sort of training them. I've done 
part of this education program of 258 we've done specific sessions on the tax system how the stock market works and all, all these different things inflation you, you know say to begin to understand about you know the you know the real world outside the boxing gym or, or, or the football field yeah i mean the same as the same as the guys have said we're we're super passionate about it as a business and also me as an individual so much so we made a documentary about it with um, bt so i look after three players whose careers have all been ended super early so for bruce mwamba who obviously um heart stopped on the pitch dean ashton who was injured well on england camp and joe thompson who had cancer twice so all three of them basically careers ended by the time they were 23 and um they all go into clubs and do work with academies now which probably wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Um, it's a passion of ours, it's a passion of theirs. And we, we did a documentary with them um, and Eddie Howe and sort of various other footballers whose careers has ended early. Just for, um, you know, the documentary was obviously to raise awareness, but the behind the scenes stuff we do is we go into academies and then it's different on the women's side because ultimately the players that came, had to be semi-pro all had jobs. So ultimately, had, they had a skill that then when their careers ended, they could go back to their skills. The players that have come into the game recently and are pros, all of my players are doing a degree. And that's generally, you know, that's not every woman in football is doing a degree because the club's insisting it. It's just the clients I work with happen to sort of realise that they have to have more than football because we don't know we certainly didn't know when it went pro in 20, 2014, 2015, that wages would be even where they are today. So there was no idea of you can retire and you're going to have a pension pot. Um, so, yeah, I think women, female athletes are very different because they realise they might need a different skill. So it's almost easier to educate them because it's ingrained in them. Mm. And I think on the male athlete side, it's just something I'm really lucky because my clients have either experienced it or mm. are passionate about it. But it's crucial. I mean, it's. Amazing. Well, listen, I could talk to you and listen to you forever, but I'm afraid that is time to wrap up. My watch is telling me to stand up, so I best do that. So um, our next SLA event that we'll be hosting is really topical. and We have a really all-star panel. We have Nick DeMarco, Casey, who's a leading sports law barrister at Blackstone Chambers. And we also have Kieran Maguire, who's the author and podcaster of The Price of Football and a lecturer at the University of Liverpool. And we have John Potterill Tilney, who's a director of club financial reporting at the EFL. And they'll be with us to discuss and explore recent developments in financial fair play. So please come along to that. It'll be a really interesting session and would love to see you there. So that's it for now. Thank you so much for coming and thanks especially to our amazing speakers, Marvin, Joe and Adam. It's been a real pleasure to have you today. Now, please join us downstairs um, for drinks and some food and we'd love to catch up with you then. Thank you so much.